Hello and welcome to our second video from chapter one, this one on dihedral groups. Just a quick reminder, before we looked at the symmetries of a rectangle, which was an abelian group. It had limitations on rotations and no diagonal flips. In the table, we could see the abelianness of it, right? The symmetry of it, because everything across the diagonal was symmetrical. So that told us it was commutative, and that's what an abelian group is. For the group of symmetries of a square, it was non-abelian. We didn't have this same pattern. It had four rotations, and it also had two diagonal flips. Well, we can extend the group of symmetries of a square to any regular polygon with sides three or greater. And we're going to call them n-gons, but it's just a polygon where n is the number of sides. So a dihedral group for a regular polygon is noted as d sub n. And regular is important here. Regular means that all the sides are the same size, right? And any n-gon will have two times n many elements. So a five-sided polygon i.e. a pentagon, will have 10 elements, just like we saw a four-sided regular polygon, i.e. a square, had eight elements. So here are some examples. We've got the D3, D4, D5, D6. We've already seen D4, um, and we're going to look at some others in this video. Okay, how about D5? Five sides means five rotations. How do we figure out how big those rotations are? Simple, just take 360 degrees and divide it by five. And that gives you 72 degrees for each rotation. Just like a square, 360 divided by four gives you 90 degrees for each rotation. And so again, we can generalize, which is what we always want to do in math. And we know that n sides means n rotations, and each rotation is going to be 360 divided by n, and then we're just going to you know, add on. So it's going to be a multiple of it. So it's going to be zero, then one of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, all the way up to n minus one many of them. And then that will give us our total number of rotations and the degree measurements for each of them. So how about flips or what are more technically called reflections? For a D5, Again, because we have five sides, we have five reflections. Just like for a um, four-sided, a square, we had four reflections. Remember, we had horizontal, vertical, and then we had the two diagonals. So we had four reflections or four flips. With a D5, we have five reflections, and all of them are going to occur from a vertice to the midpoint of the opposite side. Now, if it's a um, hexagon, a six-sided, it's going to be slightly different, right? So each of the five rotations with a reflection, or if we do it vice versa, will result in one of the five reflections. So what this is saying is if you take a rotation, right? So you rotate it by a certain number of degrees, in this case, any multiple of 72, and then you couple that with a reflection, i.e. a flip. Or if you do it in the other direction, first you flip it, then you rotate it. doesn't matter, but if you do those two things in either order, it will just result in one of our five reflections. So reflect it you know, from here to here, or here to here, and et cetera, et cetera. Right? All of those reflections can be attained by just doing a rotation and a different reflection, or a reflection and a rotation. So flips for any of these dNs. Well, n reflections across lines from vertices to midpoints when n is odd, or vertices to vertices when n is even. Um, each of the n rotations with a reflection and vice versa will always result in one of the n reflections. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, even or odd, right? It doesn't matter how big the polygon gets, doesn't matter how many sides it has, this idea of coupling a rotation with a reflection will always just result in one of the reflections. Well, why is that? Can we explain um, why this seems to be the case? Well, see if you can pause the video and put it in your own words, explain why this must be true. Okay, did you come up with something like this, that in either case, the set of points fixed is some axis of reflection? If not, don't worry. This is uh, this is not important. If it makes your head hurt, don't panic. 
Um, just remember that we've seen examples of this, right? Remember the symmetries of a square. We know that if we took a square and we flipped it horizontally and then rotated it 90 degrees, it would be the exact same thing as if we just did a diagonal flip, a flip along the diagonal um, axis, right? The, the line from one corner to the other. Okay, so groups of symmetries for D5. Well, we have five rotations and five flips. So we start you know, we always kind of have the trivial rotation, this R sub zero, and then it goes up from there, 72, 144, 216, 288, and then we're back to 360. Then we have these, these flips, right, these reflections, and we're going to use F because we don't want to use R again. So we have flip one, two, three, four, and five. Those are the ones that go from each of the five vertices to the opposite midpoint, right, the midpoint of the line or of the side opposite of it. Well, we can kind of give these things um, different names. So instead of R sub 72, we can just call that R. And then F can just be a reflection across a line from a vertex to a midpoint. It doesn't matter, you know, that we're specific about which F it is. And if we do that, then we see that instead of R sub zero, we can just call that one. And then R 72 becomes R. R144 is just R squared, R cubed, R to the fourth. You know, F sub one just becomes F. F2 is just an R and an F, remember? Because we, all of these flips are the same thing as uh, rotations and flips. And then we have an R squared F, R cubed F, R to the fourth F. And by doing this, we start to see, hey, um, these letters, these notations are starting to look like polygons. And then, oh, maybe we can use these ideas in polygons, sorry, polygons, in polynomials, you know, things that we're used to, and uh, then abstract algebra becomes something that we can do with actual algebra, right? So we do the same thing if we want to generalize it all the way to an n polygon, and we know that we get n many rotations, n many flips, and then we can apply it to it again and get 1, R, R squared, all the way up to R to the N minus 1. And then F, R, F, all the way up to R to the N minus 1 times F. And again, it looks a lot like a polynomial, right? A squared plus A, let's say, AX squared plus BX plus C, right? Those real simple polynomial type of things. Okay, what are some of the characteristics of a dihedral group? Well, we know that we have a reflection followed by a reflection is the same thing as rotation. We know that a rotation followed by a rotation is the same thing as a rotation. And we know that a rotation, sorry, a reflection followed by a rotation, or in the other direction, a rotation followed by a reflection is just a reflection. And it makes sense, right? If you reflect something twice, you just get back to the same side. So everything is, is kind of back in the right order it just might be rotated and we talked about this in the other video where if you have a mirror and you flip it so you're looking at the back of the mirror then you flip it again you're back to the reflective side so that's why a reflection plus another reflection is really just a rotation you might not be back to the exact original orientation but at least you're back to the same side so you know that everything is you know either going clock it's it's kind of going clockwise if it started clockwise if you uh, labeled your sides going uh, clockwise, you know, A, B, C, D, E, let's just say if we had five sides, and then you flip it and flip it, it, it it's going to be rotated, but they're going to be back to the same clockwise orientation. Whereas if you just flip it once, right, think about, you know, kind of flipping right along this line, then you get B is over here, right, A is over here, um, the C is over here, the E is over here, and the D stays where it is. You, you kind of they kind of trade places. You see how now it goes counterclockwise, A B C D E, to go alphabetical. So when you flip something, you're basically changing the direction of the letters, right? Instead of going clockwise, they go counterclockwise. And then if you flip it again, they go back to clockwise. So if they're back clockwise, it just means that they have to be a rotation. Either they're in their exact same location or they've been rotated, but they're still going to be clockwise, right? So that's how a reflection and a reflection is rotation. We know that a rotation and a rotation is, again, just a rotation because all you're doing is adding multiples of, in this case, 72. And then a reflection follows 
followed by a rotation or in the other direction is the same thing as a reflection. And again, that makes sense, right? Because if we only reflect once, they go in the wrong direction, right? They've gone from clockwise to counterclockwise or vice versa. And so therefore the result has to be a reflection because the only way to change the directions of those letters is to reflect. If you rotate, they're still going to be clockwise the whole time if you start it clockwise. Okay, so if we use this general notation, can we create a Cayley table for a D3? And a D3 is a triangle. So pause the video and see if you can um, create a Cayley video for a D3. Hopefully you got this table. Uh, remember that for a triangle, D3, it's going to have six elements. So it's a six by six table, right? 36 things. And we can look for symmetries and all that kind of stuff and um, see if it's going to be an abelian group, right? Is it commutative? So for instance, if we do a flip and then a rotation, right? Flip and rotation, that's R squared two, okay? So what about a rotation and then a flip? Well, right off the bat, that's RF. So we've already got one that doesn't match. So nope. It's not abelian. It's that simple, right? To be abelian, they all have to match, right? All the symmetries have to work, not just some. So if it just fails on one right off the bat, you know it's not an abelian group. Okay, how about the powers of the elements in D3? We see that one to any power is, right, always going to be one. R to the one is just R. R squared is r squared right there's no other way to describe it but r cubed meaning a third rotation gets us back to the starting point so that's back to you know kind of one think about one as being the origin it's it's original orientation and the same thing is going to go with flips right your first flip we just call f and then the second flip actually gets us right back to one so it, it, as far as how many times it takes to get back to the origin for flips, it only takes two. And then if we want to think about combinations, right? RF, that's going to be just one. And then if we do it twice, it's so RF is just RF, right? We do it twice, we get back to the origin. And the same thing with R squared. So two rotations and a flip is two rotations and a flip. And then we do that twice, we get back to the starting point. Now let's compare that to the powers of elements in D4, right? The one for the square, which we've already seen. Again, one is one for anything. R1 is one, R2 is R2, R3 is R3, and then R4 gets us back to, right? So it takes four rotations to get back to the start. And isn't that gonna be the same with all of these things, right? If we have, um, uh, D5, isn't it going to take five rotations to get back to the start? And all the others are just going to be the same thing, right? So, you know, R4 is going to be R4, R3 is going to be R3, and so on and so forth. Okay, what about flips? Well, flip one, For remember this is for D4, so we're talking about for, um, you know, a square. You flip it, you flip it again, you get back to where it was. Duh, right? So if you flip it horizontally and you flip it horizontally again, it's going to look exactly like it was. This is not, you know, flip it horizontally, then flip it vertically type of thing. It's the same kind of flips. RF, so rotation flip is a rotation flip, but you do that twice, you're back to where you started. Same thing with a double, R, double rotation flip, and the same thing with a triple rotation flip. So you're starting to see a pattern, right? Look at the, the patterns between these two groups. Right? Everything seems to be the same. We're just adding more to it. So now if we generalize it, one is one for everything. Rotations are always themselves until you get to the last one, the nth rotation, that gets you back to the beginning. Flips, it always just takes two flips to get back, right? Flip one is flip, and flip two is back to one. And then RF takes two, R squared F takes two, R cubed F takes two, all the way down to R to the N, right? Doesn't matter how many rotations then flips, when you do two of them, you get back to the start. Okay, 
So with that in mind, let's look at some examples that we can visualize. How about all capital letters in the alphabet with horizontal line symmetry? So think about a letter that if you drew a horizontal line through the middle of it and then flipped it, so flipping it what we call horizontally, like a north-south flip, um, would it look the same? So if you think about it, there's some obvious ones like um, O is pretty obvious, I is pretty obvious, H is probably pretty obvious, and here are the, uh, the rest. Okay, let's try the same thing with vertical lines. Again, I is pretty obvious, H is pretty obvious, O is pretty obvious. What else do we have? Okay, and then how about another example? How about rotational symmetry? Are any of them going to be the same if we rotate them? Now, really, O is the only one that we could rotate, let's say, 90 degrees, and it would still look the same. Maybe. It depends on how you write your O's, right? Um, but when we're talking about rotation symmetry for all these, it's mostly going to be 180 degree rotation. So think about some letters that you could rotate 180 degrees and they would look the same, like I and H again, right? And how about N-O-S-X-Z? Right? All right, so those are just some, some fun examples of those types of symmetries. Lastly, we can put it all together. There's our horizontal symmetry group, vertical symmetry group, rotational symmetry group, and then there are the letters that don't have any symmetries whatsoever. Not a lot of them, really, when you think about 26 letters in the alphabet. Okay, that's everything for Chapter 1.